Hello and welcome to the Michael Mama Show. I'm your host, uh, Michael Mamas, and we're coming to you from a sunny, sunny but chilly and windy <laughs> Mount Soma, home of the Sri Sameshwara Temple in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Uh, you know, I've been going into Ashland. Usually I just stay up here at Mount Soma, and I rarely go into town. But uh, over the past week or two, I've had a number of occasions to go into Asheville. And I remember once I was sitting in an office, looking out the window in a conversation, you know, with people there. And it just, it just struck me, you know, that, wow, what a number of different worlds we live in. The people in, I was sitting across the table from were living in their world. I saw people walking down the street, living in their world, of course, I have my world. And it's just remarkable that all these different worlds can uh, simultaneously exist, you know, and interface. Uh, and then the other day, I was uh, sitting in an office by myself in Asheville, and I was uh, kind of doing, I guess, one of my hobbies, really, which is uh, uh, looking at the structure of the Veda and the structure of how things manifest out of uh, the Veda. Uh, as addressed actually as embodied in the Vedic literature. And uh, it just fascinates me. You know, I was a double major math and physics in undergrad and um, really loved pursuing, you know, the deep inner mechanics of existence. And to me, uh, one of the reasons I left physics was because I realized that there, with the Vedic knowledge, with the Vedic um, uh, language, if you will, it, is just a much more efficient um, uh, means of approaching the deep subtle mechanics of existence and in a uh, uh, not only accessible way, but in a way where also the uh, technologies of how to work with those deeper levels of existence um, afford themselves, you know? So anyway, I was reading uh, all of this and uh, really deep in thought and gosh, it's so beautiful and so profound the deeper you get into it, the more incredible it becomes, you know. And somebody walked into the room, nice person. I don't know her very well. I've maybe talked to her a total of 10 minutes in my life, you know, two minutes here, two minutes there. And um, I don't I can't remember if she asked me what I was reading or if I just told her. But anyway, when I talked about it, she was hesitant at first. And then she said, well, she said, uh, I'm just totally, you know, soul on Christ, you know. She said, I had some deep experiences in my life and, and you know, that's it. And uh, I was fine with that. And I said, uh, in fact, I told her, I said, well, this really is about Christ. I mean, really, if you know, depending on your definition of Christ, so I don't think I said that, uh, uh, Christ is the underlying basis. That's what, what's what it means. He, he knew he was that, you know, uh, as it says, you know, in the Upanishads, I think I am that, thou art that, all of this is nothing but that. But it's one thing to get it, you know, and understand that intellectually. It's another thing to embody it, which he did. And, uh, um, but the thing is just, it's really more about the, the interfacing of worlds, you know. I mean, she has her world and uh, that's her path, if you will. And uh, I have mine, you know, and uh, uh, it's fine. And at the same time, you know, um, each world can benefit from another if the interface, if the relationship between the two is, is uh, healthy. If it's healthy, it's constructive, you know? It's not about whitewashing the planet so we all think the same, in fact, quite the contrary. It, uh, uh, it strengthens a person's relationship with their own world. It purifies it, if you will. Uh, uh, if, again, if the relationships are healthy, but very rarely are relationships between different worlds healthy. Uh, and we see this in our personal lives. We see it 
globally, you know, what's going on with Ukraine and Russia right now. Uh, the Ukrainians, you know, have their world. And uh, 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 certainly Putin has his world. And uh, see, the point is none of them think, uh, oh, I'm, I'm a bad guy and they're, they're the good guys. And so I'm going to go bomb them. Uh, uh, and so how do different worlds interact? And then we get into the whole thing. Of, and I mean, I'm not taking a side here, don't get me wrong. And I'm certainly not supporting uh, Putin, you know, bombing civilians and all that. But nevertheless, uh, we do well, I think. And see, that's why I like the Vedic literature. That's why I like Vedic knowledge is because it goes deeply into, as I said in the title, into the rabbit hole. It goes deeply into the depth of the nature of that whole mechanic. And the more insight we get into that whole thing, uh, uh, the wiser we become. You know, there's, and in Vedic literature, for example, there are the Mans Mamansa Sutras of Jaimini, Karma Mamansa. It's, it's kind of like the study of, well, karma, action, reaction, the, the world of activity. And then there's also uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, Maharishi Patanjali talked about um, Kaivalya, the silent depth of existence. And, and so the whole, then you get into, wow, it's so beautiful, you know, you get into the uh, Upangas, which is really maybe the easiest first step to understand what the Upangas are is, you know, if God was watching uh, uh, human beings evolve, and sort of uh, kind of offered assistance. Well, there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And that's where, of course, in the Upangas is where all the, uh, uh, sort, sort of like the signposts, the guidelines, the Shastras uh, uh, are given to sort of assist the evolution of uh, everything in relative. Normally, you know, we think of it as, humans, but it's everything. Uh, so, Scotty, how are we doing here? Is this all making sense so far? Yeah, for sure. Okay, good. And, and uh, um, it's interesting that, see, the process in, in the Upangas, which is, you know, that path from, we could say, from oblivion to full awakening uh, is, is the path um, that culminates in um, Vedanta. Uh, so it take, goes from Nyaya, which is the, we could say the simplest form of investigation through a progression called the six systems of Indian philosophy and finding its fulfillment in uh, Vedanta. But Vedanta finds its truth in uh, Kaivalya. So it's that idea that and it gets very abstract, admittedly, but it gets to the idea where there's an uh, interconnection between nothing is happening. Kaivalya is like the, the silence deep within the absolute, that feel of no thingness, that feel of pure isness, that feel of pure consciousness. And then that merges then seamlessly integrates with uh, karma, uh, the study of the karma mamansas, Mamansa of uh, Jaimini, Jaimini Sutras, you know, the, and the, that whole field of action. And, and uh, that's where then uh, this concept you may have heard of, of the witness comes from. Is There's Kaivalya, which is total silence, inactivity, really, no thingness, just a silent witness, and then the field of action. Now, why does this matter? What do we care about all of this? I mean, isn't that all just so ridiculously abstract that it, who cares? But here's, here's what it's about. As we, as the grip of our perspective, see, really all the Vedic literature and everything, even within the Veda itself, it's all about perspective, how this views that, and all these steps to the progression of the six systems of, in, of Indian philosophy. It's all about perspective. And at the, at the depth of our being, there's a, 
it, you can even call it the perspectiveless perspective. It's the silent witness, no judgment, no opinion, no nothing, eternally present, just simply it's experienced as, you know, witnessing the whole field of activity. And the reason that becomes valuable is what it does. Uh, to describe it with words doesn't really capture it. In fact, it, in a lot of ways, it's even more misleading. Uh, we use the analogy of the taste of a strawberry. You know, if you were to study what strawberries taste like and never have tasted one, you could get a PhD in what strawberries taste like. And then so, say, finally, after years of study, somebody hands you a strawberry and tells you, you know, taste this and you bite into it. The first thing you'd probably say is, look, I'm a scholar when it comes to what strawberries taste like. I know all about the taste of strawberries. And there's one thing I can assure you, this is not a strawberry. And that's the problem really with uh, uh, those who become, you know, Vedic scholars a lot of times, you know, in the universities or what have you. Uh, uh, if they haven't tasted one taste of the strawberry and you know a lot more about what strawberries taste like than a scholar who's studied it their whole life, you know? And, and, uh, so having said that, there's a state of physiology, a state of awareness where that lively, that Kaivalya value is there, eternally present, unshakable. Uh, and it is existing concurrently with functioning in the field of activity. And what that does is it obviously it profoundly shifts the nature of your relationship with activity. Of course, then people say, oh, well, yeah, non-attachment. Oh, yes, I will be not attached. No, that's thinking you know what a strawberry tastes like because you're still engaged. You still have convictions. It's just that they don't convict. They don't convict you to narrow-mindedness. It, it's integrated, the, expounded, the expanded awareness that holds all that is, yet nevertheless, you're in a field of activity with your your convictions, your beliefs, your world, but it changes your relationship with your world. It's, and this says it poorly, but it's almost like you're, well, you could say in the world, but not of it, meaning that um, you see the futility or the non-sense in everything that you make sense of, uh, because you see beyond the field of convictions and perspectives. But but I realized, you know, okay, what is that? That's what dwells in the depth of all of us, that field of Kaivalya. But let, yet we function in the world and, and our relationship with Kaivalya gets overshadowed by, by our identity with the service value of life. And that's really the nature of the relative. That's why they call it relative. Knowledge is no longer has any absolute value like Kaivalya, but it, it's relative to what you've been exposed to, what you've been indoctrinated into thinking. Even if you've studied the Veda in depth, then what's happened is you turn it into a perspective. And then we call that the I get it syndrome and you function then in that level, but you haven't tasted the strawberry. At the same time, we all sense the taste of the strawberry. It's what dwells deep within us as us. And so we have a certain kind of relationship with it. And what is, what is that it? It's um, what many people would call God. Other people might call it the depth of their being, their soul, you know, and that here all we've talked about is the, uh, the Upangas. And so the, the Upangas is sort of an objective look at the evolution of the world, of, of people, of humans, of everything. Why is it objective? Because, again, if we use the analogy, though, it's not a great one, but it gives you some feeling. It's God looking out at and observing us and everything evolving. Okay, so we, we are seeing that as the object of perception, God's perception, if you will. Now, there's another thing, and it's called the uh, uh, Vedangas. The Vedangas are now a subjective thing. The, the, the Vedangas are about the subject, the experiencer, those people out there, us, we're functioning in the world. This is our world. And there's a natural progression to the, uh, uh, oh, what would you say, to the uh, evolution of our awareness. Now, most commonly, the, the Vedangas are, are viewed as uh, through the 
uh, perspective of language. It starts with just basic syllables, ma, mama, you know, papa, you know, and and uh, and then from there it, it, it we form words and then we form sentences and then there's a whole study of grammar and then that the uh, study of the meaning of the words and the language and the paragraphs that are in the deeper meaning and then that evolves like that uh, uh, and that that culminates in uh, what they call jyotish jyotish means light it's you know it's a lot more than just you know, run somebody's Jyot astrology chart and call them that Jyotish. And so it culminates in seeing the light, you know, the, it's just a common expression. But, but that's all about the experiencer moving from, you know, speaking syllables to speaking words, to speaking language, to refining their grammar, to refining the way they uh, express themselves and understand the deeper meaning of the words uh, and culminating then and finally awakening to uh, a field of Jyotish in its highest sense of the word, which is also Vedanta, you see. And so it's just approaching it and viewing it from diff two different ways. Uh, it's a very interesting, you know. And, and uh, so what we do well to consider is, you know, where are we in that whole progression? Not that we say, okay, I'm at stage three of uh, the, the, the sixth, the fifth system of uh uh, Indian philosophy or anything like that. That's too superficial. But the, the idea is that um, we are like in a world that we, be, that we view the world f through those eyes and that defines the world for us. And then if we do interface with other worlds, if there's conflict can arise, that's why I, I tell people who work with me, you know, just be careful to stay out of the weeds. You know, if you're working with somebody in a conflict or don't get into the weeds with them, you know, because that's an endless trip that that has led humanity even to this day through wars between Ukraine and Russia and and uh, bickering in the office or conflicts in uh, your relationship. And why does that happen? Why do we allow that to happen? Because that place of the silent witness that level of no thingness, which is also all knowingness, huh? knowing that which underlies the whole plethora of uh, perspectives that are born out of that perspectiveless perspective. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, and why is this a value? Because we start to understand, and we and and the more we understand this deep knowledge the less then we tend to overstand and, and overstand looking down upon from the identity with our perspective. Our whole world changes, but it's not enough to get that intellectually and say, oh, okay, now I understand. No, that's a, that's when you start to understand this on that level, it's a good beginning all too, all too often mistaken for the goal, you know, and it gets, Confusing, admittedly, because at the same time, as I said, we all sense that Kaivalya value, that divinity within us, and uh, and it's precious to us. It's our soul, some would say, call it the soul, if you will. Um, and that's what makes the world go round. That's what we're all living, you know, and and there's no reconciliation of that on its own level. On the level of identity with the perspective, there is no one ultimate Maha perspective that everybody can agree upon and we have a whole homogeneous world and everybody's happy. Because it's relative, the world has and always will have two poles to spin around, opposite poles, okay? Uh, and it's the dance they do with one another, yin and yang, if you want. Uh, uh, that determines the, the nature of existence and what makes uh, our life here, our existence healthy, is the degree to which that's integrated in the perspectiveless perspective, the field of Kai value, that Mother Earth, you know, is the source for every single branch of the tree. And when the whole tree is healthy, all those branches are healthy. And in the wind, they sway in unison and harmony with one another, you see. Uh, 
And we're just pretty far away from that as a species. I mean, I hate to say it. Uh, and then people will pick up, you know, scripture, the Bible, you know, you, you know, always hearing these people say, oh, well, the only, you know, if you watch Sunday morning TV or whatever, you know, the ministers are saying, uh, well, the only way out of the mess the world's in is God. And you know what? They're right, aren't they? That's kind of all you, the transcendental level. But what, what is their relationship with that? What is their understanding of that? What is the, do they really get the mechanic of it? And also, even more importantly, do they have the techniques or the technology to free themselves from their identity? And, 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 and not that you abandon it. In fact, you, you, you nurture it, but you nurture it in a way where you're no longer overwhelmed by it and lost to it and lose your own sense of your own wisdom your own divinity by substituting it for some notion of divinity. You see? <clears throat> so, you know, when I drive by a church, for example, I'm inspired because there is where people congregate to reach out for that quality. And that's a beautiful thing, that Kaivalya quality, that thing they sense within themselves and it gets to their experience fed and nourished. And it's so thank goodness we have those churches and synagogues and temples and all that. Uh, but at the same time, is your it's like I say, it's not about the thing. It's about your relationship with the thing. Is your relationship with it healthy? Which means it's leading you to that level of Kaivalya and that integration of the depth of your being with the surface of life? Or is it indoctrinate and in, into you a fanaticism and a narrow-mindedness. And at the same time, people are where they're at. And so if, if that's how they're functioning, God love them, you know? And uh, uh, so the process, you see, of um, uh, evolving is a matter of taking a battering ram to people's identities so much as it's a, a matter of nurturing them and culturing it along the way so they can look deeper. They, they can uh, go beyond the limitations of life that cause conflict, not only in others, but within their own selves and in the world and in between nations and all like that. Uh, uh, so taking it to a pragmatic level, what do we do about Ukraine? What do we do about the whole Russia thing? It's a field of the unknown. We're functioning in the unknown. I just got an email, in fact, this morning from a student who was saying that, you know, she and her husband are struggling to get through life and stuff, and they realize they don't really know. They're just guessing what the best path is. They're doing their best, but they don't really know. It's called the unknown. It's the nature of the relative. It's unfathomable. It even says in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the course of action is unfathomable. But yet we do our best to fathom it. And the deeper we go, the wiser we become, uh, the more artful we are at that. Uh, uh, but you see, wisdom ultimately leads to wake, awakening up to uh, a field that is beyond identity with a perspective, uh, which is kind of what um, uh, Socrates was talking about when he said, the only true knowing is knowing that you know nothing knowing that you know that field of no thingness and functioning from there, yet functioning within the world of thingness, you know? Is this all making sense, Scotty? Yeah, um, I just had the kind of the notion of it's like, it's almost like you got to remember you're in a sailboat or you're in an airplane or whatever, and yeah. you're able to like move the stick, yeah. right? Left, yeah. right, up, down. You don't have to move it just left or right. You know what I mean? You have... Yeah other you know and then you, I guess you're, like you're saying is getting into touch with that you're in the boat you realize it's your yeah. vehicle to traverse the ocean of life but you're not lost to your identity with the boat yeah and like the that, sooner yeah. you, the sooner you embrace the fact that these are the rules of engagement for this thing you know that we're in <laughs> or whatever then you can kind of relax into the fact oh, okay that you know all i have to do is you know do my thing don't get stuck if i get stuck turning left all the time you know yeah, yeah. that's a problem <laughs> yeah that's right and that's kind of what we do isn't it we take a little model and we cling to it until it stops working until it realizes we're just going into a, a circle of turning left 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 all the time right. 
Well, I, I got there last time and all, you know, and yeah. to this destination and all I did was make laughs. Right. And so the, the tendency then is if we ever get to that point of frustration is to go out and try to find another belief system to cling to, which is just keeping it on the surface as opposed to going deeper. And even if you get right. into the Vedic knowledge or what have you, and oh, okay, I get it. I'm not going to do right. that anymore. Then you turn that into a model. Right. And uh, somebody once said, you know, is, is, Michael, isn't what you're teaching just another model? And I said, well, if it is, if you make it into that, it's not what I'm teaching anymore. You can do that, but it's not what I'm teaching anymore. You know, uh, uh, but nevertheless, these insights. Here's a, here's another thing that, speaking of insights, there's a couple of things in the Vedic literature. One is called the Idihasas. I think people are familiar with that because it's like the Ramayana and the, and the Mahabharata. You know, and and what those are again, it's all perspective. The Idihasas are about the perspective, the viewpoint, viewing the relative uh, from the perspective of divinity entering the relative. Now we can talk about it as, oh, okay, well, there's a story and this happened and that happened. And that's all good and true, but, but it's beyond the story as well. It's, those are um, principles of the mechanics of creation from, because see, it's all built out of perspective. Uh, 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 of the mechanic of creation viewed from the perspective of divinity entering into and interfacing with relativity. You see? That's the Idihasas. The Pranas now, which if you've read the Pranas, they read very differently than the Idihasa and the Ramayana. But nevertheless, what are they? They're, they're observations, their perspectives on the same exact process, but from the perspective of relativity, viewing the emergence, if you will, of the absolute, the uh, embodiment of the absolute as it enters into uh, uh, relativity. Uh, and they read very differently. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's all perspective. This universe is born out of perspective. And even within the field of uh, the Veda, now the Veda means that's uh, uh, everything we've talked about so far has been poor share. It's, it's been about the relative, you know? But then there's also Upur Shaya, which means not relative, it means absolute. And that's really what the Veda is. And the Veda talks about this same <clears throat> interacting dynamic, but when identity isn't lost to the dynamic, the, the true nature of the thing uh, is not overshadowed by its self-interacting dynamic. Whereas in relativity, we lose our sense of our we have some sense of it and that's called uh, uh within the realm of smirti which is memory so we still have some memory of who we are we sense it deep within our being but nevertheless it's overshadowed within the absolute there's all these inner dynamics there's rig veda uh uh well then you do rig sama tarva you know like that and also there's uh the upanishads the Aranikas. All these are uh, interacting dynamics, if you will, but un, um, occluded, if you will, un, um, um, bogged down, if you will, uh, from um, not just pers not perspective, but identity with perspective. Does that make sense, Scotty? Yeah, for sure. Oh, good, good. Yeah. And, and the whole study of the thing is so beautiful. And why do we even bother? Because what it does is it helps free us from a limited perspective of things. Now, we don't want to take, though, the whole field of Vedic literature and the brahmanas and mantras and all of that and condense it down to a simplistic model because then uh, we've just calcified it. You know, we've uh, crystallized it into a narrow point of view and decided we have knowledge, you know. Uh, and if we take that understanding, it's called humility, really. A level of humility with our relationship to things we think we know. You know? Uh, and that's really the purpose here at Mount Soma is to create something that frees us. That's why they call it spiritual emancipation, liberation. What are we being liberated from? That which overshadowed our own divinity even though we cling to those things in the name of our own divinity, in the name of our own 
spiritual growth in the name of our own safety in the name of our own health and prosperity and success it's a delicate thing you see all right i think that's it scotty unless you have something more no i think it's just worth a reminder of okay if we're loosening our grip on this it's meditating self-contemplation it's you know keep going yeah <laughs> yeah that's right there, see there is a technology to free the awareness and meditation is the most powerful tool even what we did today i think is a powerful tool it, it helps us to understand uh a little bit and get some insight into the mechanics of the whole thing yeah and you know, I, go ahead it, michael isn't it kind of like uh where you do these things, it's kind of like shaking up, shaking it up so you can start to take dips down towards or or be able to start moving towards that, that you know, area easier yeah, that, and easier and freeing yourself up. You that's know? right. That's right. And, and the danger is every step of the way, okay, I get it. And then you say, oh, wait, I, I thought I got it, then now I get it. And so then right. you're stuck again. Oh, right. no, now I get it deeper. And, and so it's the I get it syndrome until the point – Ultimately, if it culminates in something called enlightenment, then it's uh, the ultimate getting it means you don't get anything. It's a perspectiveless perspective. You see, there's no clinging to anything, yet that's in the depth of your being and you still function. You still love your kids. You still have a family. You still um, prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla, perhaps, you know. Uh, uh, of course, people say, oh, well, I've heard about freedom from desire and therefore I don't care what kind of ice cream you give me. No, that's not what freedom and desire means. Freedom and desire means you're awake to that level of your being, which is free from desire. But that doesn't mean that on the surface of life, you still don't have your desires and your beliefs and your preferences and your perspectives. You see? Even mistakes and things like that, too, right? It's like it's not like you have to play by the rules of the relative, while you're here, right? Is that kind of accurate or no? Well, you're in the relative. Yeah. And therefore, you're playing in accord with the rules of the relative, but you're not uh, uh, limited and bound by it. Right. What well, your relationship with these rules is as healthy as it can get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that, that once you get the integration of the karma moments of, of Jaimini, uh, uh, the Jim, and then the uh, uh, notion of Kailaya that Patanjali talked about so much, once those two things, polar opposites, I mean, they're opposite. They simultaneously exist, exist in harmony with one another, but which is it, <laughs> you know? Uh, anyway, I think that gives you enough to think about, and I think it, it makes the point I could talk about the structure of uh, Vedic literature for days. And again, it just gets more and more beautiful. But I think, I think a lot of people, it becomes too theoretical. Uh, 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 and so I don't, you know, I, I, I don't talk about it that much, but it's my personal hobby. You know? All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time on Ancient Secrets Revealed.